Tom Sorensen had a terrible accident. As he was flying in the air, Tom saw his hand was still in the car, gripping the seat cushion, severed from his body like a prop. In the weeks afterward, even though he knew that his arm was gone, Tom could still feel its ghostly presence below the elbow. He could wiggle each finger, reach out and grab objects that were within arm's reach. An athlete who lost his arm in an accident continues to feel a phantom arm with vivid sensations. He can wave the missing arm in midair, touch things, and even reach out and grab a coffee cup. If you pull the cup away from him suddenly, he cries in pain. Ouch, I can feel it being wrenched from my fingers. This phenomenon is a very common medical condition. It occurs in more than 80% of amputees, and it is known as phantom limb. A phantom limb could be an arm or leg that lives on in the minds of patients long after it has been lost in an accident or removed by a surgeon. Some patients with this condition experience excruciating pain in the phantom limb, so horrible that they can think of suicide. The pain is not only relentless, it's also untreatable. No one has the foggiest idea of how it arises or how to deal with it. As if it is not difficult enough to treat chronic pain in a real body part, imagine trying to treat pain in a limb that does not exist. The persistence of sensation in limbs that are long gone had been noticed as far back as the 16th century. After Lord Nelson lost his right arm during a battle, he experienced persistent phantom limb pains, including the horrible sensation of fingers digging into the palm. This led him to claim that his phantom was direct evidence of the existence of the soul. For if an arm can exist after it is removed, why can't the whole person survive after the entire body is gone? That might not sound very convincing, but in medical literature, there are records of hundreds of fascinating case studies. Some of the described phenomena have been confirmed repeatedly and still cry out for an explanation, while others seem like far-fetched products of the writer's own imagination. One amazing story is about a patient who started experiencing a vivid phantom arm soon after amputation. Naturally, he was quite puzzled, but the doctor didn't know how to help. Finally, out of curiosity, the fellow asked, whatever happened to my arm after you removed it? The doctor said, you need to ask the surgeon. So the fellow called the surgeon who said, we usually send the limbs to the morgue. So the man called the morgue, what do you do with amputated arms? They replied, usually we incinerate them. Well, what did you do with my arm? They looked at their records and said, buried it in the garden behind the hospital. They took him to the garden and showed him where the arm was buried. When he dug out, he found it was crawling with maggots and exclaimed, well, maybe that's why I'm feeling these bizarre sensations in my arm. So he took the limb and incinerated it. And from that day on, his phantom pain disappeared. Other bizarre stories include a patient who experienced phantom erections after his penis had been amputated, a woman with phantom menstrual cramps, and a gentleman who had a phantom nose and face after his face had been severed in an accident. The phrase phantom limb was first coined by famous physician Weir Mitchell after the US Civil War. In those days, gangrene was a common result of injuries and surgeons sawed infected limbs off thousands of wounded soldiers. The doctor himself was so surprised by the phenomenon that he published the first article on the subject under a pseudonym to avoid facing ridicule from his colleagues. Since then, there have been all kinds of speculations about why phantoms happen. For example, a paper in Canada claimed that phantom limbs are merely the result of wishful thinking. A second, more popular explanation is that damaged nerve endings in the stump are fooling higher brain centers into thinking that the missing limb is still there. Based on this reasoning, surgeons have devised a treatment in which they cut and remove neuromas. Some patients experience temporary relief, but surprisingly, both the phantom and the associated pain usually return with a vengeance. Sometimes surgeons perform a second or even a third amputation, making the stump shorter and shorter, but that too cannot treat the pain. But why would a second amputation help anyway? You'd simply expect a second phantom. And indeed, that's usually what happens. It's an endless regress problem. Surgeons went even further to treat phantom limb pain, cutting the sensory nerves going into the spinal cord. Others try the even more drastic procedure of cutting the back of the spinal cord itself, a chordotomy to prevent impulses from reaching the brain, but that too is often ineffective. 
or they will go all the way into the thalamus, a brain relay station that processes signals before they are sent to the cortex, and again find that they have not helped the patient. They can chase the phantom farther and farther into the brain, but of course, they'll never find it. So where is the phantom? Let's delve into some neuroscience for some clues. Our brains have a neurological map of our bodies. Wilder Penfield and his team tried to explore this map by stimulating nerves in different limbs and observing which area in the brain is being activated. To visualize the data they gathered, they came up with this grotesque illustration. In the illustration, the hands and lips are overly represented because they have much more nerves connecting them to the brain and therefore cover a much larger area compared to other limbs, like arms and the torso. This representation of the body map in the brain has come to be known as the cortical homunculus. Another thing they discovered was interesting arrangements of areas corresponding to each limb. It is roughly upside down and not in the correct order as one would expect. For example, the face is mapped next to the hands and genitals are mapped next to the feet. But immediately one might wonder one thing. Is this mapping fixed at birth or can it be modified in an adult? The questions led Tim Pons and his colleagues to conduct a research on monkeys. 11 years after a surgery, they opened the skull and re-examined the animal's brain. Since the monkey had a paralyzed arm that was not sending messages to the brain, you would expect to find a big patch of silent cortex corresponding to that hand. And just as expected, when the researchers stroked the useless hand, there was no activity in this region. But amazingly, when they touched the monkey's face, the cells in that region started firing vigorously. What was going on? It appeared that the area that was previously responsible for the arm had been invaded by the sensory information from the face. A legendary neuroscientist, Dr. Ramachandran, was bewildered by this experiment. He immediately saw the connection between this data and phantom limbs. He thought, could this be the long-awaited explanation? What did the monkey actually feel when its face was being touched? And he had a brilliant idea. He invited Tom to his laboratory, placed a blindfold over his eyes, then started stroking various parts of his body with a Q-tip. What do you feel? You are touching my cheek. Anything else? Hey, you know it's funny. You're touching my missing thumb, my phantom thumb. How about here? You're touching my index finger and my upper lip. Really? Are you sure? To obtain direct proof, they also used a modern neuroimaging technique, and it turned out Dr. Ramachandran was right. A remapping in the brain had occurred, and the sensory information from another body part was causing phantom sensations. The implications of the finding were staggering. They suggested that brain maps can change, sometimes with astonishing rapidity, and contradicted one of the most widely accepted dogmas in neurology, that the nature of connections in the adult human brain are fixed. So in Tom's case, it seemed the phantom emerged not from the stump, but from the face and jaw, because every time Tom smiles or moves his face and lips, the impulses activate also the hand area of his cortex, creating the illusion that his hand is still there. Stimulated by all these false signals, Tom's brain literally hallucinates his arm. If so, the only way to get rid of the phantom would be to remove his jaw, but then you would probably end up with a phantom jaw. So we are not quite there yet. Another insight is that the remapping is not random, but usually occurs with the neighboring areas. In Tom's case, it was the face region, as it is right next to the arm. And if the missing limb is a leg, then the rewiring might occur with the genitalia region, and indeed, some patients have reported having strange sexual sensations in their missing leg. Actually, what if the reason some people have foot fetishes is that in their brain, the foot area has been invaded by sensory coming from their genitalia? Or women can be sexually aroused through their ears because they are mapped next to the nipples. So while searching for an explanation for phantom limbs, we ended up speculating about foot fetishes. Good story, but not the whole story. Why? For one thing, it doesn't explain why some patients feel like they can move their phantoms voluntarily. Where do these movement sensations come from? Second, remapping doesn't account for what both doctor and patient are most seriously concerned about, phantom pain. And third, what about a person who is born without an arm? Would that person be born with phantom limbs? As always, trying to answer one question leaves us with more. But maybe those are for another video. 
Also, the journey is long, and we are just beginning to take steps towards understanding the most complex object in the whole universe, our brain. The content of this video is from this amazing book. Highly recommended if you want to delve deeper into this topic. And if you don't like reading, then subscribe, and we will meet in another video. Thank you for watching.